of the MISP and Farsight Security Integration. Uh, today, our, our primary focus is on the uh, introductory uh, presentation. And uh, there are a number of different webinars we have planned um, today's introduction to passive DNS for threat hunting. Uh, we have two additional webinars planned for May 4th and May 11th. And our presenters will provide a little bit more detail on that as we get going. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have uh, two executives from the Circle MISP project. We have Alexander Delanois, a security researcher and core member of the MISP project. We also have Christian Studer, who's a security researcher and core member of the MISP project. And on the Farsight side, we have Boris Teratin. He's the principal architect for Farsight. Again, welcome everyone. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you do have questions, we're probably gonna try to get to them towards the end of the 90 minutes, but feel free during the entire presentation to put them in through the chat window, which should be at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Um, Boris, Christian, and Alexander may decide to take some questions as we go along too. So feel free to put them in there. Um, we'll probably stop to take questions about 75 minutes into the presentation. Uh, this presentation will be recorded and a copy of the slides and recording will be made available by the end of the week. Thank you so much. And Alexander, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Great, good morning, good uh, uh, afternoon maybe for some of you and maybe good evening for some of you. Um, so uh, I'm really glad to be here today and uh, talking about passive DNS uh, and all the uh, things that we do uh, within the MIS project and uh, along with Farsight. Um, which is doing it for like so, some years now. Um, so that's quite interesting for us because we were involved in passive DNS for, for some years at Circle uh, on, on the uh, backend side too. Uh, and uh, now we have seen that uh, passive DNS is basically something that is actively used in uh, trail hunting and so on. So just a, a quick introduction. So I don't like too much talking about bios and so on, but. Uh, so I, I did work for Cisco for, for some years now, I think close to, to nine years, 10 years. Um, and uh, I'm quite involved in various open source projects. Um, so I, I did work on, on the MIS project from the early beginning. Um, and we have seen over the time that the open source projects are, are, are think, taking more and more space into the cyber security system, ecosystem. Um, why it's like that is basically because it's, it's accessible, but it's really uh, increasing the capabilities of teams and organizations to uh, use open source tools. And I think today, and that's something that we, we discussed with Boris uh, from Farsight, it's we have seen a trend nowadays that a lot of organizations are starting to uh, use more and more open source in their day-to-day -day activities, uh, especially for trail hunting, uh, automations, and, 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 and stuff like that, and activities like that. Um, so really wanted today, and uh, especially for the next two sessions that Karen mentioned, um, we will talk about Today, really, as the introduction about passive DNS, what is missed for the, the one that doesn't know missed, uh, and then uh, we will go more into the uh, different uh, aspect of hunting and finding things uh, from the passive DNS uh, information that you can you can collect. So, really, my background is, is really in, in information security, uh, trail hunting, and so on, um, and, and then this kind of contribution to the, the open source uh, aspect. So, Boris. Very good. Good afternoon. Good morning, uh, everybody, depending where you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Boris Tarat, and I'm principal architect at Farsight Security. I came from the corporate world, uh, defending uh, large organizations, helping them to understand what cybersecurity, cyber defense is and isn't. I started my career maybe 30 years ago uh, when security, cybersecurity perhaps was the term in uh, science fiction. Uh, I came to the uh, to the love to this field, and I decided to leave corporate world for a company which is Farsight Security. And the mission uh, of this uh, small company, which I'm part of proudly, uh, is to make the internet and safer place uh, for everyone. This is why uh, I am here, and I would like to share with you, together with my colleagues, uh, uh, you can see on the screen, uh, the great thing which we can do together. Uh, as Alessandro mentioned, open source uh, gets a lot of attention now. And we also have open source tools, but the data we have would be uh, granted uh, 
to those who are qualified. And at the end, we will uh, uh, let you know how to uh, request that access. Uh, also, we can have uh, commercial relationships, but again, uh, towards the end, you would decide whether you want to do it or not. Uh, with that, let us begin. And our agenda would be, it seems I cannot move the slides. Alexandra, can you just progress for one? That would be our agenda. First, we will uh, make an introduction to DNS uh, search and why is this uh, important for us. Passive DNS and uh, DNSDB, uh, this is a trademark of outside security uh, passive DNS data, uh, bootcamp, very quick one. Then Alessandro will uh, introduce you to MISP uh, platform, the concept, uh, uh, how to drive, how to share data, how we, Farsight and MISP are being integrated. Uh, our future plans, what would be next steps that we would improve to help you to utilize a uh, passive DNS within Farsight platform even better. Then it would be a post for questions if you would wait till that time. If you believe that your question is very important, please interrupt. We are absolutely fine with that. And we will give you a little bit uh, uh, introduction hands-on to uh, passive DNS uh, search as well as to this platform. Very basic because we have another two webinars which will dive deeper and at the end, which uh, would be a uh, third part, we will uh, introduce a full-blown uh, investigation uh, uh, to uh, a compromise, the real-life compromise, which happened many, many years ago, and you would see how you can reveal what happened at that time. Before we say goodbye, uh, Karen will uh, uh, share with you uh, a, a lot of information which will help you to navigate further, both on Farsight side as well as uh, MISP, uh, to gain more knowledge between today and the next webinar, so you would be able to come prepared. Let's do next one. All right. Uh, anything on the internet, good or bad, starts with, uh, or almost everything starts with DNS. Uh, there are two fundamental protocols on the internet, DNS and BGP. Uh, I always uh, 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 joke that who controls those control the internet. Uh, if you understand those protocols, you would be able to be uh, a very, very uh, uh, efficient in investigating uh, goodness and badness uh, on the internet. And there are many uh, things to investigate uh, for us, those who uh, attend this webinar, those who uh, protect large and small organizations, government, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and businesses. There are many crimes uh, happening, and if they're happening in the digital world on the internet, they almost always, almost always leave the digital footprints in DNS. On the left side of this, you see uh, some of those perhaps you deal with uh, every day. Data exfiltration, denial of service, malware, phishing attacks, spam fraud, espionage, and many, many, many more. Once again, you would be able to look very deep if you understand the uh, DNS uh, as a protocol and how you would be able to uh, navigate through that data that we uh, at Farsight observe across the globe. More details on how we do it would be next uh, uh, next webinar on uh, May 4th, and I invite you to join. On the next slide, you would see some of the very interesting uh, use cases where DNS search and passive DNS can help you to be very, very efficient against even very, very capable actors. We have anti-phishing. We have brand protection as a use case. We have drug enforcement, investigation of uh, journalism. I will not go uh, deep in those. The slide deck would be available to you, but all those crimes uh, would rely on the DNS uh, as a medium to help you navigate the internet. And those observations, those facts, those evidence would be at your fingertips and we will teach you how to use them efficiently. 
if you go to the next one, the question by this time, potentially, which could be in your mind, okay, so you talk about DNS, but where we will find those, those, uh, those uh, uh, indicators of compromise, as we call them, or clues to navigate uh, a passive DNS? Well, uh, first of all, the DNS is publicly available. And passive DNS make those uh, data for you. So we absorb this data, the data which uh, is in open internet, and we make those data collected for uh, over 10 years already. And we'll make it, we make it available through different means. In this particular case, we will talk about uh, a DNS uh, database, DNSDB uh, from Farsight. The alternative was uh, who is data? It once was a very, very important tool, but with the privacy laws and some other restrictions, uh, it becomes not very uh, useful tool for investigators uh, at this uh, time. Yes, uh, some information you may get from who is, but uh, very often, uh, especially criminals, they hide behind the privacy guards. The part of DNS, uh, is a historical data. As I mentioned, we go back uh, for over 10 years. The earliest record I found when I started with Farsight was April 2010. So as you can see, if something happened to your business, to your organization between then and today, almost certainly we would be able to find the records of the DNS queries which happened at that time. The entity of interest very often have multiple domains and multiple websites. And those, if you find one, very likely that around that environment, whether in IP network or within a name system, uh, you would find more than just one. And the reason for this is uh, the not only mode of operation of the uh, uh, cyber criminals, but also economics. If you find a safe place, safe haven for uh, for yourself to do the bad deeds, uh, most likely it will attract more criminality, more badness uh, to that, uh, because otherwise security researchers, those you could, uh, you see, would be presenting today, and many others would definitely find that uh, bad activity and eliminate it through different means available. And that actually makes us, as we call it, a thematic vulnerability. Because as I mentioned already, the criminals use those spaces on internet to, uh, to be safer if let's say uh, ISP provider or name uh, 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 DNS provider are reluctant to take those activities offline. The way to navigate that would be to find the keyword or IP address or uh, uh, domain name or host name, and then navigate through the uh, database, uh, through the tools which we offer at Farsight, or even uh, uh, more powerful and convenient tools, which you can find within uh, the MISP uh, platform. Let's go to the next one. If you're not familiar with DNS, and we have this assumption, uh, because this is uh, an introduction uh, uh, webinar for you, uh, DNS is a very complex, uh, very, uh, versatile, uh, very robust, uh, highly distributed system for, uh, for, for not only for speed and convenience, but also for uh, resolving the growing needs uh, of the internet. It started small and now it is uh, very big. To understand and utilize that system, you need to have some uh, basic uh, understanding of the different types of DNS records. Because when you try to investigate the criminal activity or bad activity, or even, even audit your own environment, which is not uh, bad, uh, you need to understand what different records or different parts, uh, pieces of information would uh, indicate or tell you. 
There are many records. Some of those you can see on the screen. So-called A record, this is when domain name is resolved to an IP address. This is why perhaps you probably heard the analogy that uh, uh, DNS is a phone book. So you have a name and then you have a number and therefore it looks like a phone book. Uh, in my view, it is uh, much greater than uh, just a phone uh, book. And we will touch on this uh, perhaps later, maybe uh, 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 in the next webinar. There is much more information you can get than just to convert name to IP to the number or number to a name. Code A, this is when you convert or resolve the domain name or host name into the IPv6 address. IPv6 is version uh, six of uh, IP protocol. And that is because we are, as you probably know, almost out of uh, IP uh, version four uh, addresses, those which you are most familiar with. And IPv6 is sometimes even hard to look at if you are not in the uh, networking, but this is also very important for you to, uh, to understand the presence and existence. CNAME, this is a pointer. Basically, this is one name is pointing to another name and that name could point to something else and then to something else. When you look at criminal activity, see names uh, very often uh, uh, used to hide uh, something uh, 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 from being obvious. And when you uh, dispose something, then something else would uh, take over. Uh, eventually, every name from this top three would resolve to an IP address because this is where a system needs to go. NS record, this is uh, the record of the name server. This is the server which tells you uh, where to find authoritative answer to the questions you have. MX is mail exchange. Uh, obviously, it uh, tells for itself. This is where email needs to be sent to. MX record is a recipient server, not a sender. This is also quite important uh, uh, to understand. Text records, it can have anything really. Uh, I hope to show you today how we can utilize text record for something that uh, you might not necessarily think uh, when you use passive DNS uh, as an investigative tool. Uh, this would be quite important to uh, understand, for example, why a phishing email landed in your inbox. You look at it, you see it's phishing, perhaps very well crafted, and yet it is landed in your inbox, or even more dangerous, in an inbox of your uh, CEO, and CEO was about to click on the link. SOA, start of authority record. So this is a description of the whole uh, tree. Uh, I am simplifying. But for today, that would be sufficient knowledge for you. Another record which uh, potentially could be very interesting, uh, it's a survey, a server pointer. It tells you, was it a question or you just forgot to put yourself on mute? Krishna, I think you are, unmuted perfect thank you very much great and you may uh, switch the camera off because not everyone has a bandwidth to, to to get the video okay so where was i i was at a survey record uh this is the record uh which communicates uh, about specific services uh, which you might uh, uh need to know if you would like to know a little bit more we have a great post uh and this is the link you don't need to make screenshots. The slide deck will be available uh, for you. If you go to the next, this is basically will give you a quick start into navigating uh, DNS uh, world and the passive DNS uh, uh, specifically. Passive DNS uh, database would give you an answer very similar to what you can find uh, when you use a nest lookup or dig command. This is a structure of uh, a DNS record. 
on the left side, this is resource record name. On the right side, this is resource data. I will inter interchangeably use right side, left side uh, uh, when I would uh, do the demonstration. Uh, once you get to this terminology, then we will use the uh, proper uh, uh, technical jargon, but it's not just, uh, necessary really. You just need to understand what is that you're looking for. You're looking for a phone number, knowing the name, or you have a phone number and you are looking for the uh, uh, for, for the owner of that. So on the left side, once again, the source record name or owner name. On the right side, it's data. Data could be in numeric format, like an IP. It could be yet another name, like a name server. It could be, for example, Dikim key in text record. It could be email address in. Uh, uh, are uh, P, a responsible person record, and there is all variety of different uh, types of information. We collected that information since 2010, we indexed that, and you would be able to search either through the right side or through the left side. In the middle, it is a, uh, a record type. There are more additional information, but this is all at the moment that you would need to know to be very effective uh, navigating passive DNS or DNS data, and also understand what you would be uh, getting uh, within uh, MISP when you get access to passive DNS. Initial searches would be on your uh, uh, left side, so the resource uh, record name, our site, circle, uh, Google, this is your asking. You're providing the owner name, and then you get the data associated uh, uh, from it on the right side. If you would like, for example, to audit your environment, then you would say, this is my IP, what I see, or what you saw for the last 10 years on that IP or on that net block. They will teach you how to do it. All right, uh, let's now summarize what I just mentioned previously, and we go to the next slide. Picture is better than a thousand words. If you have a host name or an IP, what you can get from passive DNS? Passive DNS, again, we are absorbing the DNS queries and DNS answers which are available in uh, on public internet all across the globe. We have uh, approximately 500 sensors on almost all continents, uh, well, apart from Antarctica. We plan to have one there as well. So we do see a lot. No one can see everything, but we do see a lot. If you combine, by the way, all the passive DNS uh, vendors and providers, it's still possible that you can identify a record that no one saw. But we see a lot. So why knowing host name and IP address is important? Well, because you can identify other host names on the same IP address, which you can see right now, but you can do it uh, through an SLOCOP or DIG. But most importantly, historically, going back 10 years, this is very important if you have some compromise and the resource just disappeared from internet. You receive phishing email, you try to NS look up, and you get a next uh, uh, domain, which is not existing domain, an error. So the criminals already dismantled this infrastructure, and you have no record of what actually has happened 15 seconds ago. Most likely we see it. Oh, by the way, uh, today I received phishing SMS, and I went there and uh, I found that that domain was registered literally like 20 minutes ago. So this is the power of things. But if you do dig, it's not there anymore because it probably uh, was took down. Or if you get 000, it uh, got uh, itself in a, a, a block list and you wouldn't be able to progress. Same with the IP. If you have an IP address, you would understand not only what was on that IP address, but also you can query a net block, the neighborhood. Why neighborhood is important? Well, we all live in cities and towns, and you know that that part of the city or town is not necessarily uh, safe to go. Why? Not because of one house over there is 
somehow uh, not safe. There is whole neighborhood there which you probably would avoid. So if criminals find something, it most likely because of the economic of the crime, uh, they would utilize that IP neighborhood uh, uh, and a lot of bad resources would be there. If you have a domain, you can find what are other hosts within that domain. You cannot do it through an SLOOKUP. For example, if you have google.com, to enumerate all the hosts, uh, you need to know those names. If you don't know the name, you will get an error from DNS server. But if somebody queried that name and we saw the answer, we would be able to see, and you would be able to see what are those resources on that specific domain. Also, you would be able to figure what are other domains are served by that name server. So you have a domain, let's say Farsight Security or Circle, and we also have domain uh, uh, name servers because you can resolve our names. But those name servers not only serve us, they serve others. For example, Circle name server potentially may serve a MISP project. Our site name server may uh, serve another thousand different uh, domains. Why it is important when you investigate crimes? Because uh, if criminals, as I already mentioned, find some uh, infrastructure which is reluctant to respond to legal queries or law enforcement uh, 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 may not necessarily reach that specific uh, uh, geography uh, uh, region, then they would concentrate around that. So you would see on the same name server a lot of bad uh, uh, activities and based on your experience and the desire to investigate, you will very easily, uh, sometimes easily, sometimes not, identify those uh, bad resources. But that's not the only thing which you can do. With the recent announcement of flexible search last year, you can now have even more power in your hands. And on the next slide, something amazing you can do. For example, Let's say you would like to investigate type of coding. You can put a keyword and you can search uh, DNSDB, passive DNS uh, database, back to 10 years on all resources that would resemble your company. If you look, for example, at Microsoft here, and let's say a uh, second column, a uh, uh, second line. I bet if you receive email, which looks like from Microsoft, your brain will substitute the spelling uh, mistake and you likely would click on that link. Despite on any training, which you can uh, have from your company, this is something that uh, criminals use to, uh, to trick people uh, uh, to, to, to access uh, uh, bad resources on the internet. So you can use patterns to identify the activities of your interest. Not only through keywords, you can uh, create a regular expression and you can go and figure out the DGAs, domain generation algorithms, or other patterns, which for example, might be related to uh, brand infringement or uh, some uh, identification of the uh, phishing sites. Another very interesting use case, which you probably wouldn't uh, very easily associate with uh, DNS or passive DNS, is uh, common contacts uh, or crypto materials. Uh, for example, you have an email or a specific phone number, and you know that DNS also uh, has that information in text records, start of authority records, uh, RP records and so on. And if let's say uh, you identified a criminal activity, uh, which also automated, you can identify all resources that have very specific uh, uh, type or, or pattern. Uh, crypto materials. This is something that uh, uh, also very important. For example, DKIM key. This is a email authentication protocol. No one stops a criminal to create a pair and sign email and send it to you. And uh, 
email authentication protocol uh, would uh, uh, your email server will check the uh, signature, signature is valid, and let it go. And if email is crafted uh, well, then uh, then no machine will identify that. Why is it important? Uh, well, because uh, because if two entities use the same public key, that means they have access to the same private key. To have access to the private key, they also need to have a shared secret. What it means is you cryptographically bound two entities on the internet to something which is Dikim key. And today I also would be able to uh, show you uh, how to do that. All right, uh, why don't you go to the next slide? And this is a kind of a, a brain teaser of what you would see when you use uh, the tools from Farsight to identify something of your interest. In this particular case, uh, in a graphic interface, this is DNSDB Scout, our uh, web uh, uh, interface to DNSDB. On the right side, uh, you would see a command line interface. In this particular case is DNSDBQ. What I was asking here was, I asked, hey, DNSDB, can you please tell me what are the mail servers I need to send email to foforsightsecurity.com, but not, not only today, but back 10 years. And here we go. Uh, you can see that uh, Farsight uh, was uh, formed uh, in 2013. And we do have this record, 2013, you can see it, either on graphic or, uh, or uh, in uh, CLI, command line interface. And you can see ssvix.su. .su, this is TLD for the country which doesn't exist anymore. And our CEO, Paul Vixi, this is Vix, he just decided to uh, acquire a domain in TLD which, 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 uh, of the country which doesn't exist. He himself uh, tells the story, uh, but very uh, soon uh, it was changed to uh, FSI.io and now we have exchange of FSI.io. This is where you can send your email to Karen uh, and Karen will uh, already have provided you, has provided you with your email uh, address if it is uh, necessary, if you would like to reach us. Now, uh, there are very interesting question here uh, what do you think how passive DNS will work once uh, DOH kicks? Excellent question. I will answer that one. Do you think that will affect that passive DNS scrolling methods in general? Passive DNS doesn't crawl. Passive DNS sitting and absorbing questions and answers. So that is not crawling. Uh, but observation will be uh, affected. Uh, however, it all depends where the sensors would be placed. So between you and your recursive, information will not be seen. So if you're a defender, this is detrimental to you. But our sensors are above recursive. So recursive will go to the internet, retrieve the answer. So passive DNS sensor would see that information. We do not see who is asking. In fact, we are so privacy concerned and uh, uh, that we, we specifically don't want to see it. So there is nothing personal. We don't know the MAC address, we don't know IP of the system which is asking the question. It's only the recursive uh, uh, DNS. So personal information is not a concern for us. We don't have it. But uh, depending on the provider you have, those would affect, would be affected by a DOH. DOH is DNS over HTTPS, right? But again, because you are above the recursive server, and if you are above that recursive server, who uh, receives the request uh, uh, encrypted, then, uh, then then we still would see it. Another very good question is here: Does passive DNS collection has some impact on GDPR in general? We just uh, look at the public, and as I already mentioned, we don't observe any uh, private information. We are above recursive system, 
uh, recursive DNS, and uh, we don't see who is asking. We only see what was asked and what uh, was the answer, and that is public information. Current provided uh, email, and now you know the MX server for FSI uh, IO, so you can send it safely. What about a DOT above the recursive then? A DOT. Um, what is a DOT? Maybe I can answer that one. So, a, a yeah, DOT, go on. Yes, yes, the authoritative DNS over TLS. So, it, it's basically the connection between the authoritative uh, DNS and this in, indeed uh, might have an impact on, on the collection aspect. Um, of, so, I, I, I took a circle, uh, not that as far side here. Um, indeed, if you have passive DNS sensor and collections, um, such kind of, of scheme might at some point uh, change your model of, of collection. I mean, for Circle, where we do passive DNS collections, um, we did change a bit the model. Uh, we, we have, for example, collections that are more closer to the organization themselves, or even on the client side. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have a project called D4 Project, where we are collecting a passive DNS on the uh, edge or from different methods. So, the thing is, from my perspective, I think on the long term, we will see an evolution of collection. Uh, if we see that the uh, authoritative DNS uh, for example, or recursive have different communication scheme that you can uh, not monitor directly, uh, it will evolve over time. Uh, it's even a very good question there. Um, so the thing is, um, I mean, we, we have seen evolutions, and I'm sure that the far side they have seen uh, that's coming too. Uh, and uh, I mean, for, for example, for, for us as a third, when we do the collections, uh, we are looking at different methods of collections. For example, we, we, we do collections on, on, on data mining aspect. So that means we do active resolving them, and you have a passive uh, system doing the collection. So it's more like less passive, and it's more like uh, uh, active then. But that's a complete uh, complete topic that we can discuss even in the next next uh, in the next session. Uh, but indeed, the collection of passive DNS is a vast and uh, a broad uh, discussion there. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, these are very good questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other as, uh, as of this minute? Because now uh, Alexander would be uh, taking over. Yeah, so um, don't hesitate to, to drop questions and so on. I really like uh, seeing such kind of good questions uh, during such kind of sessions. Um, so I will do a quick introduction about MISP. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with it, some, some basically less, so I want to just put everyone at the same level. Um, so. MISP is a, what we call nowadays a trade intelligence platform with a strong focus on information sharing, on sharing back analysis, information, and, and so on. It's a complete free and open source uh, project. Uh, why we are doing that is for a very, I would say, selfish reason. We are doing that kind of sharing of information because we think that sharing is one way to, def to improve defense. And we want that people are sharing more, and that's why we are providing such kind of tool like MISP uh, to make it accessible to everyone. Uh, one objective of the goal of MISP is to collect information. So, for example, collection could be uh, from incident response, forensic analysis, um, and collection could be, for example, from passive DNS and extension like that, and so on. And we aggregate this information into uh, to MISP, so you can run your own MISP, aggregate that information. And the aggregation can come from, from, I would say, manual investigation. So it could come from, from uh, uh, analysts, uh, other partners, collaborators that are people or, or, or working with you. But it can come from tools. So you can, for example, ingest data from, from different systems. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But you can, for example, inject, uh, you can inject data from log analysis, CM, and so on directly into MISP. Or you can even uh, ingest, for example, from uh, spam trap, uh, honeypot, and stuff like that. And you can collect this information. That's really one of the goal of MISP is to be able to aggregate easily and correlate this information. And that's really one of the things that is important is to find out if such kind of event already happened somewhere else. So, for example, to find out that a specific incident or a specific 
um, indicators have been seen somewhere else already uh, investigated by someone else and so on. And that's really the thing with MISP is not a static information. It's really a tool for sharing, investigating, and collaborate. So the sharing aspect can really be local. So it could be a sharing between uh, two teams, uh, even two team members. It could be between two different organizations. It could be different communities, like, for example, uh, Isaac, uh, other organizations like uh, SOC, and so on. So that's really the, the idea behind, behind MISP is to have a tool, so an open source tool that people can actively use to do collaboration and sharing. Uh, and that's really the thing. So if you're interested in MISP, just have a look at the MISP project website. Um, that's maybe of, of uh, one of the right place to get all this kind of information. So just a bit of history about MISP and that's showing the background. So it's, it's more than 10 years that we're working on the project. Uh, it's really coming for a practical use case. Uh, so it's, it's a tool that has been uh, designed and developed over the time to provide um, something that is really practical and, and used on a day to day basis. It started as really as a very specific thing. So we were, uh, we wanted to solve a specific problem with, uh, we were like meeting at regular, uh, uh, regular interval for doing malware analysis, but we wanted to share that information with others. And that's where it started. So it's where the names came from. It was initially malware information sharing platforms. Nowadays it's, it's basic information intelligence, so it, it's more, much more than that, you, and I will, I will show it later, but it's more trade intelligent information that you can directly share and, and modelize as, as you wish. So it's really coming from practical use case. So when we design the tool and when we design a MISP, it's really based on, on, on use cases, things that people want to see, and how the software needs to be uh, able. So for us, it's, it's, it's kind of commitment, so we really want that uh, it's a long-term project, so we have plenty of organizations using it. Uh, we are really committed to do long-term development because we are users of it too. So we think that it's really important and, and we want it to, to evolve. And session like today for us is important because it's a nice way to see how we can even evolve the platforms into something more useful for the community. Um, and uh, for example, discussing for example, with Farsight help us to uh, extend the platforms into uh, more collaboration aspect and sharing aspect. And so so uh, in addition to that, and that's, I think, quite important too, it's over the time the platform and the, the, the format that we developed into MISP uh, became a de facto standard. So now we, we, we split from the MISP project itself to the standard, to the format itself, to the JSON use for exchanging information, sharing, and so on, is standardized. So it's an ITF standard. Uh, it's published on the MISP standard website. It's, it's really an open. Uh, system. So the project includes that part. In addition to that, we include uh, uh, knowledge bases. Uh, those knowledge bases are ac accessible to everyone and they are part of MISP but can be reused in other tools. As an example, we have knowledge base for a uh, list of ransomware. We have a, a pretty extensive knowledge base for all trade actors' names. Um, so that's quite, a, quite important. So we, in addition to just maintaining the software, we maintain collection of, of information that can be used for uh, doing relationship between trade, uh, between trade actors, uh, between ransomware groups, and, 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 and stuff like that. So for us, it's, it's a project that has grown over time into a huge set of things. So not only the, the tool itself, but it's a standard format. It's a backend for a lot of knowledge base and a set of different tools. Uh, if you look on our GitHub repository, we have around 50 different repositories for different uh, aspects of uh, the MISP uh, toolset. Um, there's a question. Yes, you, you, for example, for, for modules uh, of the NSDB inside MISP, you need that key, and I will, I will go in, into that part later on. The um, thing that is important for, for us and, and for MISP, and, and we, that's why we have some idea with the Farsight Labs, um, on, on, on working with them for, for extending this. We have a flexible model. So um, some of the tool sets that you know in trade intelligence are fixed to a model. So they, they, they for example, say it's, it's a trade actor described by uh, the stick standard in this way. So it means it's a bit different. We provide the accessibility to the object definition, template, and so on. So that means everyone can create uh, and extend uh, the model of uh, or you structure information. Just in the example that you have here, it's, it's a very simple uh, uh, example. We have what you call object for URLs, and those are uh, describing uh, uh, some, some phishing URLs here. And you can really describe whatever you like in this. Um, so it could be 
things like in cyber security URLs, uh, uh, things like uh, IP port, things like that. Passive DNS record, that's the topic of today, and you'll see that this one is a complete object in, 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 in MISP. But then you can create relationship between all those objects. And you'll see that when you, you for example, do an expansion of passive DNS record, you have relationship with all the uh, information there. And that's really creating, you can create your own stories. Um, in this example here, what do we have is, uh, it's uh, um, some URLs that are uh, used for, um, uh, for phishing. Uh, and you see that this one is coming from a byte link. Um, so we even mentioned the tool that did the analysis. In this case, it's a tool that we provide called Lupilu, uh, which is basically doing analysis of the URLs. And in addition to that, you see all the analysis that Lupilu did, uh, the redirect, um, the various ending pages, which is quite important because if you want to do investigation, you need to, to see the full uh, set of, of activities up to screenshots and, for example, the various total reports or specific URLs and so on. So you can really create your own. So those ones are automatically created by the by Lukilu, so using this directly. But as an analyst, you can do it and extend it uh, in the system, either manually or using one of those expansion services. So that's something that you really need to keep in mind is MISC, you can really customize uh, uh, the object models. So we have around 250 models nowadays. Uh, but you can really create your own. For example, we have this discussion of creating um, a specific model for the passive DNS query in themselves. Not the result that we already do, but really the queries. So how you query the passive DNS. So like that, when you share an investigation, you don't only share, only share the result, but you share how you perform this investigation. So you share, okay, I did this and I did this query, for example, on the far side passive DNS. And I did this kind of query on, for example, various total, or as the DCR rules um, to get more um, um, uh, malware and so on related to the same signature and so on. So it's really something that you have to keep in mind with MISP. You have a tool set and you can really extend it to extend, uh, to extend the model. So the, the graphing, uh, graphing extension for, for MISP, uh, it's part of MISP. So it's called Even Graph and it's part of the uh, MISC, so install MISC, you have uh, an event graph capability, which is really part of, of MISC on a day to day basis. Uh, I, I, can, I can show you later, but what you see on the right side is a description as an object with relationship. So you have the reference there, and the left side is a visualization of it. And we try to do quite versatile on this. Uh, so that means you can either create your graph by just creating the relationship in kind of column based, but you can create the relationship by just drawing a line between two boxes and you will create automatically the relationship. Uh, so the, the graphing uh, aspect is really part of MISP. So if you install a, a MISP, you'll get uh, that functionality directly. So on top of that, within MISP, we have what we call expansion services and what we call MISP modules. Uh, so MISP modules are, are separated from MISP. It's, uh, it's a set of modules. Um, they are written in Python 3. And you can ext easily extend MISP to do whatever thing you like. And uh, one of the things, and, and for the today's session, is, is extending, for example, MISP to query the DNSDB of Farsight to get more information. And um, uh, Christian, which is part of, of, this, of this session today, uh, developed a specific modules for, uh, for MISP to do the expansion services. On the right side, what you can see there, it's an automatic expansion. So that means we query the DNSDB and we structure it, even the data back as a MISP object, and you see this kind of passive DNS object. So what you can do with that is really importing the data and so on. We have around 200 modules for doing expansions. Farside DNSDB is one of those, uh, but there are plenty, uh, plenty, uh, plenty of those available, and you can really extend it. And it's quite easy, even for very complex API, uh, those modules tend to be like 50 or 40 uh, lines of, of Python code. So it's easy. I mean, the far side one is quite complex. It's, I think, 150 lines, so it's, it's really small. Uh, so if you really want to extend this, uh, it's, it's straightforward. If you have even basic programming capabilities in Python, you can really do it. Uh, you can enter, and a lot of people are extending this in that way. Uh, so it's a very, uh, very simple, uh, simple way of contributing uh, and extending this. Either you keep it for yourself, you can even provide it back to the, the community. Um, then 
what exactly the, the expansion module provides? So you have two main modes in an expansion module. So you have what we call the other modules. So the other uh, uh, approach. So how does it work? Um, the other one is, is basically you have the event, you have an attribute, and then you have a, an overlay on top of it, which is uh, showing you the uh, specific passive DNS value. And, but sometimes you just, just don't want that. You really want to insert the data into uh, into MISP. Uh, it just we call that uh, you can use it to complete the MISP event. So the expansion, you will select the result of the passive DNS query, and you can just subselect the part that you want in uh, in uh, in MISP. Uh, something that uh, and I think this is I think quite important. I think Boris uh, mentioned it, and I think this one is like a key in a, a passive DNS. Um, in addition to just getting the data itself, we have a strong uh, uh, model of importing the time aspect of an object. So, the, and this one, this temporal aspect is really critical. Um, I just took an example here of of, uh, of uh, Circle. So, automatically, when you import the history of the, I think it was the www.circle.lu uh, um, hostname, you get from the passive DNS all the history of the domain. And that's super important. In this case, for Circle, it's straightforward. We, we, we uh, basically moved from one machine to another machine. So it's moved to, to a C name called cpa.circle.lu back to cpab to circle.lu. So it was migrated to another machine, which is currently directly spotted in, in MISP. So in MISP, we have what we call this event timeline. So um, we, we, we see the timeline of all the time reference that we have in a specific event, and you can really see the timeline. And that's really key for a lot of investigation. A practical example, very often you have uh, trade actors that are switching their infrastructures, either because their infrastructure has been uh, discovered by um, an investigation, or they have to move for various reasons, or sometimes even uh, infrastructure change and, for example, are not more compromised. So, for example, if you have a domain that is used by a trade actor and an antivirus company is taking over and, and putting a sync call on um, that record, you will automatically see it on the passive DNS. So that means you have an exact timeline or an exact time telling you, okay, at this time, the infrastructure has been taken over by, uh, for example, a law enforcement, an antivirus company, a CCF, whatever. So, and we really have a strong, I would say, feeling that it's super important to have this kind of information into. Um, so the, the default model uh, that we have with the passive DNS uh, and the far side DNS uh, DB modules that we have in MISP uh, is getting that information in. We do the same for restricting the information. So for example, if you have a temporal information about the indicators, so what we call the attributes in MISP with information, you can expand it and just scope it to that specific uh, time. I think Boris will, will show you some example after once on, on the far side DNS uh, DB uh, side. So you see that for us, either you do manual investigation, or you do automatic expansion and getting all the data to, to expand, pivot, and analyze your uh, data uh, directly into me. So the integration is really straightforward um, and uh, you just need an API key to access it. Uh, uh, I think uh, Farsalian provides a trial uh, uh, DNSDB access, and I think a lot of security researchers, and thanks to them for that, are using DNSDB for doing their investigations. And usually it's a very good source of information for, for finding uh, additional information. If there's no specific question regarding MISP, I will hand over to uh, Boris. Yeah. Uh, now you know. Uh, a little bit more about DNS, passive DNS, about MISP platform, how we work together, some uh, plans for us to uh, do even more. And I would like to point out, Alexandra, there is a, a question within the chat about the module. And uh, I would like to point out that uh, they are questions that passive DNS, only passive DNS, would answer that regular DNS or any other conventional methods cannot answer in principle. When I say in principle, it means there is no other way to find it. 
doesn't matter how hard you try, you cannot exceed speed of light to transfer information from point A to point B. That's the way how the nature works. So there are questions which you not be able to answer unless you go to the historical uh, record in uh, passive DNS. As an example, uh, I already mentioned, you received the email, you believe it's harmful, you go to DNS and domain disappeared. Unless you have those historical records, you wouldn't be able to find uh, much and progress during your investigation. All right, uh, with that, uh, it is uh, time for questions and hands on. We still have half an hour or actually maybe 25 minutes before we finish. And I would like to show you some stuff uh, in, in live. So would be Alexander. Uh, with the next slide, it's kind of a prompt for us to have a hands on. But before I do that, uh, when I change the screen, the questions are welcome. Please unmute yourself and uh, fire up. All right, if Alexandra can give me permission to share, that would be great. Perfect. And now I can share my screen. Where is my screen? Screen one, I guess. Screen. Screen one, screen three, screen two. I guess this one. Can you see my screen? Okay. On, we will. Black, it's yeah. A black, it's a black screen. It's a black screen. It's a black screen. This is the problems with the live. This is number one. This is number two. This is number three. Number two. No, I need number two here. What about now? Do you see anything? Will not. Then I will share just my application. Do you see my browser? Much better. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. So let's start with something with the graphic interface. Uh, for many, it is a little bit more uh, uh, convenient to observe. Let's look at something that was published uh, by FBI last year. FBI identified uh, spoofed FBI internet domains for some cyber and disinformation risks. Be advised that FBI is on .gov TLD. But as you can see from the list, there's many more domains which pretend to be FBI, but they are not .gov. Um, were currently at that time not resolved. So as I mentioned, they disappeared, but they found to be malicious. So how would you go about to help FBI or uh, uh, a law enforcement agency of your country uh, to identify similar domains? We use flexible search, we construct regular expression, and we ask, can you tell us the resource which starts with FBI, that probably would be uh, uh, better to see, start with FBI, but we exclude .gov at the end. Let's see what happened in the last 90 days. You click and wait and see uh, how easy or difficult it would be for us to find those domains which would pretend to be FBI. Now, not all domains which have FBI in their name or resources would be malicious. 
right? Because FBI may not necessarily mean the religious agency uh, within the United States, but it could be something else. Or better investments, for example, it would be financial side. And it definitely wouldn't be on .gov. We identified, or at least found, at least over 5,000 uh, uh, records. And let's say for A record, we identified almost 2,000 results. And let's take a look at those. FBI.ac, FBI.ag, FBI.gov. Well, that's a very interesting resource, right? It pretends to be FBI, but completely elsewhere. You can go and investigate deeper. You click once, and now you pull a standard query, and you now see that that specific resource sitting within this domain, sitting on this IP. You can go and see what else is sitting on that IP and make our own judgment about goodness or badness of the resources which you find there. Let's take a look at those which are the most recent. April 21, Nature.com, something else. Well, obviously, this is also something to spoof or distract attention of uh, people. And it's sitting on this domain, so www.nature.com. This is something that I would uh, uh, say is suspicious. www.newyorktimes.com. As I mentioned previously, <laughs> if you find something bad, it is very likely that badness would uh, uh, concentrate around that. So not necessarily this specific domain is bad, but the resources which that domain hosts on this specific IP obviously would require some additional uh, investigation. And this is the pattern. So now you can take a pattern, dub, 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 dash, something, then dash, then dot com, right? And then Everything else is like this, and you will identify all those things uh, at once. So let's see, dub, 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 dash, something, and we already have a lot of those, which potentially can be, can be a, a, a subject for investigation. Cambridge.org, Science Direct. You got the drill. Very easy and uh, very powerful. So we helped FBI or any other agency just identify even more suspicious resources. And not only resources by name, but also where they are being hosted. What we can do also, we can say uh, 24, and we can get neighborhood of that specific IP. And we also see a lot of stuff which uh, let us, which is being hosted around there. Some names may potentially show some activity which you as an investigator might want to investigate further. Okay, we're done with that. Uh, suspicious email. We will go through this example through command line interface, but before that, Let's look at the DKIM. DKIM is a part of DMARC, which is email authentication uh, protocol, which helped us to identify the emails which presumably come from trusted resources. If email comes, you would see in the header something like this, which is a signature. Again, this is a Wikipedia resource. And uh, you would have in the signature of your email something like this that D identify the domain, S would identify a selector or the DKIM key. To find the DKIM key to verify the signature, you would need to go and search this record. And then you will receive something like this. Good exercise to take this E and figured out what exact domain was obfuscated by example. We can do this quite easy. But what I would like to show you would be something else. Of course, it is a rather um, staged uh, 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 test for us, uh, demonstration. But uh, I just know that there is some linkage. 
I do this, let's pretend we received an email and we would like to investigate this specific uh, domain or this specific key. What I do, I just search and I retrieve a record which consists of this key. This is a public key. Now, I am interested in whether other domain have ever had this key. Why it's important, as I already mentioned, if you have public key, two entities have public key, they should have a private key to sign the email. And if that is the case, then you would cryptographically bind those entities together. So I have the key, and now I would execute a standard uh, flexible search as a regular expression or keyword, but now I'm searching through the data on the right side. So I know, and you know as well, that this is being communicated within the text record, text record. So now I need to go through all the text records and check where that key is present. I don't need to check anything here. What I do, I clean time fencing because I would like to go to the 10 years in history. And when I do the search, I will identify all the resources, not necessarily text record because I didn't specify text uh, specifically, but all the resources which you would have that specific entry on the right side. So I'm going through the right side. This is quite a, a difficult task because we are going back to 10 years and what we have found here, eight results. Now, you would see or ask the question, right? So this is a public key. That public key is the same. How come it is eight records? Well, because they're different. Just highlight this, for example, and this. These are two different records, even though the public key is the same. What you can do now, you can just go, I don't know, randomly, let's say through this one and execute the standard search and you will find one domain which used this specific key. Now, let's go back and back to this eight results and let's try to find now we found two results. So now these two domains used the same public key. Very interestingly, this domain was using it in 2015. And then completely different domain is, was using it in 2020. If you go through other records, you will find that at some point, very specific text record was used uh, was used by as many as eight domains. Oh, here we go, nine domains now. Going back to 2015 and seen as early as a couple of days ago. And this is nasa.gov. This is very interesting. Uh, we have a result which was not necessarily .gov, for example, China code.jp and some others. And at the same time, the same public private key pair is being used for government agency. So this is a very interesting result. Again, this is an example. I am not making any judgment whether it's bad or good. What I do know now that all those domains are linked through the private key to sign emails. What that means, we definitely would need to go uh, deeper and understand that. So we done with very powerful phishing investigation. Oh, by the way, why is it important? If it was a phishing email, or God forbid, a phishing email, a spare phishing email to your executives, now not only you can identify a specific domain which sent it to you, but also other resources which potentially may send 
very similar email, malicious email, and you can take an action, either block it uh, at the uh, firewall or your email server to stop all those domains which have used or are using the same key. So that's how important that uh, would be. And there are potentially many other use cases, but we don't have much time. We have another two webinars. Let's take a look at another uh, uh activity. This is Western Union. Let's say you're at Western Union and you would like to identify uh, resources on the internet, which would uh, pretend to be a Western Union. So is it possible? Yes, it is. Uh, for that, I will change the gears and now you see my command line interface. Do you? Yeah, no, we see it, yeah. Briefly describe what happened, right? Uh, don't send. So whether you can see, continue to see it or not. I say share, don't send. Can you still see it? Yeah, we see your terminal okay. through the DNSDB flex. Perfect. So what we see here, it is DNSDB flex. This is command line utility, this is open source. You can get it from GitHub, install it, get the key and you're in business. What is that I'm doing here? I'm saying, hey, DNSDB. I will throw at you a regular expression and I'm interested in westernunion.com at the beginning of the owner name, but I would like to exclude anything related to the Western Union proper. So westernunion.com at the end, whether it starts or a dot in between. And I would like to see it in the last 30 days. Here, I would like to see only owner names, and then I sort it, and I check the unique. Very simple thing. Why I'm showing you this? Because you can script it. When you script it, you can automate it. Then you can get this result and export it into the uh, MISP platform. If you execute this query, and for example, you're not interested in anything, but you would like to investigate, let's say, this port for whatever reason, right? So let's investigate one of those. What have I done? I said, hey, DNSDB, I am throwing it to you, the Western Union, dot com, dot something, something, dot Seagate, dot com, and tell me what you know about it on the left side. So I am giving you resource name, give me the data. Well, what we found here, was a C name, a pointer to Amazon Web Cloud. The resources which pointing me to the same Amazon Cloud system. Looks like we just lost the Boris. Uh, okay. Ah, now it's back. Boris, we see your terminals, but we don't hear you. Sorry, can you see? Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Yes, apologies. Yes, Zoom uh, kicked me out for whatever reason. Um, now, what we can see here. We saw one resource on the Seagate.com, Western Union, something, something, session expired, HTML, something else, Seagate.com. And we've got another one, again, session expired and, uh, and so on. And they both point at the same host in Amazon Web Cloud. Why I picked it up? Because it feels to me that it might be potentially the same uh, phishing kit against uh, Western Union, which points at the same cost in Amazon uh, uh, Web Cloud. 
And that would be something that I personally would recommend uh, Western Union uh, to investigate. Well, if you look at those resources which we identified unique within the last 30 days, uh, obviously it will uh, uh, make Western Union busy. And I'm not picking at Western Union. This is just out of blue. You work for Citibank, JP Morgan, you work for uh, British Telecom, Bell Canada, whatever your company you defend, try this and see whether someone wants to impersonate you the same way as Western Union was uh, targeted. This is all I wanted to demonstrate. I gave another uh, time now to, uh, uh, to Alexandra and Christian to demonstrate some tricks with uh, this platform. Please go ahead. Yeah, so we'll share my screen. Uh, yeah, so you need to give me back the host, uh, Boris. And you are muted. Yes, how can I do that? I you select my person. name and you just uh -huh. I select your name and I stop video spotlight, allow record, no spotlight for everyone. Don't remove it. Video chat in spotlight. Make host, make host. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Very good. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, so you can not see my screen. Okay, so um, what you can see on the screen is basically a missed, uh, a missed instance. Um, so we, I will just show you um, uh, what we can do quickly with uh, the uh, passive, DNS, uh, passive DNS modules. So we, I will create uh, what we call an event. So an event is, is uh, basically a, a, an envelope of information um, where you will put some uh, additional data. Uh, so it's kind of an envelope where you, you put your analysis and so on. So for example, I can call it investigation. Um, I would just make it just sharing between circle and far side. So like that, I don't pollute my misc with other, other people that can, can see it. And uh, you see that we have this envelope that is basically empty. So what I can do is I can create an attribute. So what is an attribute is a kind of indicator. So for example, I can create an indicator for www.circle.lu. Uh, I'll take this one as a network activity. I will mention this one is a host name. Uh, it's quite important in MIST to specify the type. Uh, automatically, MIST is able to find that, but it's, it's really helping uh, later on when you have modules because modules are based on the type itself. So in this case, what we have, I see I have some correlation with existing uh, test I did. I have my uh, domain there. I can, have, I can have a look at the uh, expansions of um, uh, this domain. So what the module will do is basically querying uh, the passive DNS of uh, Farsight, uh, which takes a bit of time now. Okay, and then I have the result back. So this one is what we call the over module. So what I, I showed to you with, with the other module, over module is, is that. So what do we have here? We, we see that we have a, a list of objects, uh, which is the passive DNS object. So it's one way of doing your investigation. So you can start to use uh, MISP as a way to collect information so or to quickly navigate uh, from the indicator that you have in MISP uh, to as this information. Another option, and, and this one is, is like when you want to do more investigations, uh, it's to do the expansion and then to add this information back into uh, your event. So in this case, you have the result and you can decide what you want there. So for example, I, I'm not interested in that uh, record. So in this case, I will, I will uh, uh, remove it, for example. I can just say that I want, uh, I want this one and I will just submit this into my MISP event. So automatically MISP will uh, add those objects to my uh, event. So you see that the enrichment is done. So from this original host name, I have a set of um, objects. 
So we discussed about the event graph, and, and someone asking, uh, was asking a question about the, uh, um, the uh, graph uh, representation and so on, and how, how it works. Um, so I'm going back to the event graph view. So now what do we have there? We have um, a set of objects, and you see that we have already relationships. So this relationship is coming from the passive DNS. It's from this host name that we uh, pivoted. We have uh, three uh, additional um, uh, DNS uh, DNS records. So, for, for example, I can I can do some uh, additional investigation and to show you how MISP could be useful to modelize anything that you you want. So, for example, I will create an object uh, and I will create a, a person object. So, um, this one is a, a template for an object for a person. Uh, so, for example, I can have uh, uh, John as a first name, as his last name, he has uh, John Doe. Uh, this one has an, an alias like uh, Donald Duck. Uh, you can add a, a picture to the person and so on, phone number and so on, but I will not go deep into that uh, today, just for, for showing you quickly how these things work. So, we'll create a new object. So, that means I have one of those objects uh, uh, created there. And if I'm going back to the event graph, what do I have? I still have my um, relationship with the passive DNS, but I have a, what we call an unreferenced object. So I have this person, John Doe, uh, with uh, alias Donald Duck. And if I want to tell a story, for example, uh, we are doing investigations, we are collecting, uh, I don't know, evidences on LinkedIn, on, on, on Farsight passive DNS, on Varistotal, and, and uh, from, from analysis, from who is record, and so on. And I can, for example, tell a story about this. So, for example, I can say for this specific machine uh, that the uh, person uh, uh, owns this machine. So, that means he's the owner and the proprietor uh, has a proprietor on the on, on this. And you can really create a complete story out of uh, your um, information in MISP. So, I, I just took like Starting from a DNS, uh, DNS entry, I did some expansion with uh, passive DNS, and then I started as an analyst to add more information. And you can go further and further. And it's exactly the same with, uh, so for example, if I want to, uh, to go a bit further, I can, for example, uh, use what we call the free text import. So it's, a, uh, it's an import where you can, for example, enter uh, um, IP addresses. And automatically, you can enter IP addresses, hashes, and so on. And automatically, MISP try to guess for you what it is. And you see that automatically, you find out that, okay, um, there are already some uh, um, interesting records there. Uh, and you see that one is, is maybe of interest, maybe one is less. And you see for this one, automatically, I have the other modules of the passive DNS um, coming in. And then you can uh, see the, um, the uh, record. And I can do exactly the same that I did before. I can just like, okay, I want to have this information into my event. So I will do the expansions automatically, look at what I have. For example, I'm, I'm fine with everything that is there. And automatically, it will be imported as a, an expansion into my uh, MISP event. Just accept. There. Okay, so, and again, going back to the, uh, um, even graph, I can see now the different relationship. And you see that maybe at some point in time, you might have a specific relationship up, uh, appearing between different, different records. And you can even tell, tell a story as an analyst and extend it as, as you wish. Uh, something else too, uh, and this one is interesting, we uh, collect information from different places automatically. And the nice thing with that, is we have a complete timeline. So we can navigate through the timeline because the thing is behind the scene, uh, we get the first scene, last scene from uh, the passive DNS record. And you see that, for example, that circle was registered like in uh, 2011. We see that we, for example, register in 2012 DNS OK. I'll tell you it was an initiative for um, specific um, um, malware activities and so on. And you see that you can really tell a story just based on the event, uh, and, and, well, okay, in this case, it's, it's legitimate use. But if you have, for example, malicious activities and so on, you can 
uh, find out that uh, in, 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 in MISP by collecting such kind of information. So it's a quick introduction of how the MISP module with Farsight is integrated and what you can benefit out of it. Uh, in the next two webinars, I will go more into details and especially uh, specific investigations together um, to see uh, what are the potential and what you can do and some, some and how to get some good idea uh, for an analyst to uh, pivot and maybe find additional information about the specific attackers, infrastructures of an adversary and so on. So that's uh, really uh, the thing. So that's basically it for the uh, quick introduction. So if you have any questions or additional questions, is the time to do so. Is there any complementary questions before that we uh, finalize the webinar? Okay, so uh, I'll let uh, maybe uh, Karen to uh, conclude there. Great, Alexandra, thank you. And thanks to Alexandra and Boris for a great presentation today. Again, just to recap, this was an introductory uh, webinar. It's the first of three that we have planned on showcasing the, the MISP and Farsight integration. Today, we, we talked about passive DNS for threat hunting and introduction, part one. Um, May 4th, we're gonna be doing a, a second webinar entitled Exploring Real World Use Cases to Advance Cyber Investigations. And I sent you the link in chat, but feel free to go back to the registration page where you signed up for today's webinar. You can register for the second and third there. And finally, the third webinar scheduled for May 11th uh, is entitled Advanced Threat Hunting Techniques. Uh, this has been a great event. Um, just to um, go back to the final slide, uh, there's a number of resources um, for both Farsight and MISP. Uh, thank you for putting that back on. We had a question inside chat about how to access or get a DNSDB API key. There's a number of ways. Uh, we do provide grants for security researchers. We also have what we call Community Edition. It's a free entry-level tool. Um, feel free to check out the link that we provided there. And of course, there's a commercial service as well. Um, we also have Farsight Labs. I put that in chat. Again, it's an opportunity to join our community, uh, access early stage and free tools. Um, we have a number of case studies on our website. Uh, Ms. Xander, do you wanna go through the different um, resources that you make available to your community? Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, sure. So uh, thank you, Karen, that's, uh, that's very insightful. And I mean, as a security researcher, I'm really thankful of Farsight security because very often I'm, I'm digging uh, some cases, investigation, and so on, and, and the data set that are in DNSDB is, is, is really, really useful. Um, regarding MISP, um, we, uh, if you want to uh, start to use MISP and so on, go to the MISP project web page. We have a link regarding the download, we, and you can get access to, um, uh, to, to install your own MISP. If you want to, access existing MISP communities. There are plenty of those, uh, depending on uh, who you are, from which organization you belong to, uh, you can get access to. Um, on the MISP community website page, you have a list of existing public communities. If you want to join uh, one that is operated by Circle, you can drop an email at info at circle.lu, uh, and then you can, we can give you access to one of the private sector communities that we operate. Um, so if you want to have a look at the various MISP modules that we have, uh, uh, we have an extensive documentation of the different uh, uh, different things there. Uh, we we are it's a quite active community. Huh? There there are more than 400 contributors in, in MISP, um, so we are uh, releasing a, a new version of MISP every three weeks. Uh, so it, it's an active it's pretty active. So if you need support and so on, we have a different chat group uh, channel where people can communicate. So it, it's really important that if you want to join, um, think that it's an open source project. So don't hesitate to contribute back because your feedback is super important. And I think to conclude for today's sessions, um, it's really important that what we bring together, uh, it's, it's a, a better way to, to make the internet and, and everything in a safer place for everyone. Um, so uh, that's really, uh, really key. So I uh, really thanks everyone for, for joining. And uh, thanks uh, everyone uh, from Farsight, uh, Miss Pen Circle for, for uh, providing input and all the questions that we had were very interesting. So don't hesitate to register for the two next session that we have 
um, running especially on, on the investigation aspect. Uh, and don't hesitate to collaborate with us if you have any questions, ideas, and so on. We will be more, more glad than happy, uh, and happy to, to receive your, your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you very much. Pleasure. And again, a, a recording and a copy of the slides will be made available on the MIST website uh, by before the end of the week. Today, thank you very much for attending the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.